I'd like to introduce Camille Houston, a member of the Haight-Ashbury community for many years. Also my good friend and known by a lot of people, I'll have her explain as Camille Colorado. My name is Rebecca Nichols and I'm moderating this oral history for the Haight-Ashbury uh, Library. Um, Camille, can yes, you tell me a little bit about your nickname I've heard, Camille Houston? Camille Houston. I mean, Camille <laughs> Colorado, excuse me. Camille Colorado was my AKA when I was working in uh, a lot of alternative organizations when I first began doing textile work in uh, the 70s. And uh, I was working for a lot of organizations that even though I come from a very liberal family, I wanted to be independent of them. And uh, I had a name that was based on a uh, talent that I had, which was face painting. And it means Colorado, it means painted, as in Palo Colorado, which is also the name of a redwood tree and a canyon in Big Sur where I have some land that's very special to me. And so I went by Camille Colorado because I was doing banners for Coyote, the prostitute's rights organization, and I was doing banners for Proposition W, the marijuana initiative, and the Libertarian Party, enough said, and uh, liberal and uh, sometimes radical organizations. And so I wanted a name separate from my identity as a private person. Exactly. Well, it's just, it's a very sweet name, and it suits you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I uh, I want to ask you some some questions about your beginnings. Um, uh, of your parents, uh, the par your parents' names. Where did they migrate from, or or their parents? Where did they migrate from? Originally, where were they from? And how did you find yourself here? And where were you born? And uh, did you have any brothers or sisters? Um, and children. All right. Okay. All right. Well, my, my father came from Austria and my mother came from then Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic now, when they were very young. Um, probably World War, shortly after World War I. And uh, they met in Southern California, which is where I was born and my brother. I had a brother who was two and a half years younger than me named Gilbert, after his father. And um, we lived in Southern California uh, until I married. And then I married... What's your, what's your husband's name? My husband's name is Tom Houston. And he was my childhood sweetheart. We met in the seventh grade. Amazing. And uh, we married when we graduated from college. Wow. So at that point, we moved to Madison, Wisconsin on a three-year National Defense Education Act fellowship. And uh, it was there that I met the San Francisco Mime Troupe when they came to town with their show, Oh Damn Watermelons, <laughs> oh, damn watermelons. and uh, <laughs> the minstrel show. Uh, we were expecting one of the Mime Troupe to come to our house because he had been a schoolmate of my husband's at Harvard. And uh, instead, we ended up getting the entire Mime Troupe because uh, what had been planned as a lecture on the campus by Ron Davis on Guerrilla Theater turned into the first Dow demonstration in the country. And we went to hear the lecture and it was canceled because there had been tear gassing and a riot. And the band was wanted for inciting a riot. And so we happened to live at the end of a dead end street near a lake and it was a perfect place to hide out. So I ended up with the whole mime troupe there. And they gave me some beautiful posters, psychedelic posters from uh, Wes Wilson promoting bands at the Fillmore. And uh, they told me there was an incredible art form coming across in the Haight-Ashbury and to uh, visit them when we came to town. And uh, they'd give us more posters. So that was my introduction to the San Francisco psychedelic scene. And uh, then later on, we moved to Baltimore, to Johns Hopkins University, where my husband was an associate professor. And uh, I had my only child, who is a beautiful young artist named Tara Claire Houston. 
And at that point, we decided we wanted to get serious and come to California so my husband could pursue his photography. And uh, we moved to Berkeley and then very quickly into a family home in the Haight-Ashbury in 1971, right after my daughter's first birthday. Now, this, this family home was in your husband's family for a while? Uh, my husband's grandmother had rented it in the 30s, and they had always been renting it until we moved in. And even when we moved in, it had been abandoned because the neighborhood had gotten very, very dangerous. And um, most of the relatives had died or married and moved somewhere else. And so there was this enormous, beautiful flat absolutely what street available. Which street is that on? It was on Page Street. It still is. I still live there. Between Lyon? Between and Baker and, and Lyon, Lyon Street. And uh, so we moved into that house and the lady who owned the house lived upstairs in two floors. We lived downstairs in two floors. Wow. And the rent at that time was $125. We had 18 rooms. <laughs> It was just a wonderful place. And so was, you're telling me this was a Victorian? And it's a it was pre-quake Victorian, pre yes. And it was not split like many of the Victorians in the Haight-Ashbury. No, there had only been two owners at that point. So it still is not split. It is it's, still... It's still... It was built as a duplex, and it's still not split. Um, we're the third owners. We bought it in 1975 when the lady who owned it, who was a very close friend of my husband's family, all that time finally moved out into the avenues where it was more convenient for her for her health. And then we moved upstairs to that duplex. I just think that it's just so amazing and historical that to find in San Francisco and in the Haight-Ashbury a Victorian that has not been split into four floors, you know, private entrances and the original design of the building to be a family home with an attic, with a study, with a, a library. It, it still has that feeling, it's original stained glass, uh, turned banisters and uh, moldings and things. Uh, it's, 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 it's amazing historical building here in Haight-Ashbury because very few have not been split through the years because of monetary reasons or mm -hmm. whatever. So I know, but the families have been very constant and many families have lived in it during that time, but they have all been our personal friends. So it's been like an extended family. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So um, you mentioned your daughter. About how old is she now? She is in her 30s. And she is an artist? Yes, she is an artist. She um, is in the um, UNICEF Permanent Children's Collection in New York City. And she was she had a six person show when she was about eleven at the De Young Museum. Wow! Uh, a psychiatrist was studying um, talented people and the growth spectrum from children um, from a very early age till seven. And she was one of the six students in that study. Wow! And so she had a show at the De Young Museum that was very pivotal for me. Um, because it opened up several categories that led to my future work here in the Hague. Wow. So, um, I'd like to ask you about some of your... I would like to ask you uh, about some of your um, experience. I know you've done some uh, work with the De Young yourself. Um, you've had some creative inspiration. You've been around creative people. Um, and. Kind of what happened here in the 60s that continued through the 70s somewhat. Um, there was a lot of the inspiration and, and what was going on. Some of the, the storefronts were empty um, on Haight Street because it was such a transition. But yet here we are in 2005 and children are still coming from all over the world looking for something. And uh, a lot of the people on the interviews we've done said they hoped that maybe we could make peace in our lifetime. They hoped that by loving their community and their neighbor, they would show on a small scale the, the, that we could really work together and find things we agree on on common ground. And some people have told us that they've been inspired by the music. Some people were inspired by the posters, uh, on and on. Um, 
you 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 lived here and you still live here as part of the community in the Haight Ashbury. Um, what makes you feel comfortable to be in this community as a creative person? And maybe a little bit about your your walk down Haight Street that one day inspired this idea to get more creative and actually interact with the public mm -hmm. on a on a business. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit about mm -hmm. that on any level. Mm -hmm. Well, at that point, we had many people coming to our house all of the time. We had artists, we, we were involved with a lot of music festivals and people would come and visit us. And it got very hectic for me and a friend invited me to go out for coffee one day and I went up to Haight Street and walked into a coffee house that had been an empty space a few months before when I had looked at it and tried to imagine what business I might be able to do with it. I where, thought, where was this uh, on it, Haight Street? It is in the very center of Haight Street on the 1500 block between Ashbury and Clayton Street. Okay. In the middle of the block. Okay. And uh, it had been developed with an infrastructure from recycled old pier pilings into several small shops leading on to a coffee house that had a moat around it with goldfish and a, a bridge. It was very uh, romantic and imaginative and fantastic. So the, the time you saw this before, it was empty. And now it it had been same. empty. There were piles of rags. The people uh, who were clearing it out were taking things to flea markets. Right. And it was a vast cavernous space. And now there were these individual little, little shops, tiny shops. And it all led down to this beautiful coffee house. Um, and there was a for rent sign there. And so finding my home very hectic, I decided this would be a fantastic experience to have my own place to get away just a few blocks away. And I rented it from these three men who um, had been to India to follow the Maharishi Ji and had taken the name Haranya Loka Limited for their business operation. And they ran the cafe, which was called the United States Cafe. And there still is a very famous restaurant that had been there for decades called the United States Cafe in North Beach. But this is, was a more metaphysical concept, the United State of Consciousness and Love, On rather Street. than the United States of America, right. even though it was a reference. Right, right. And um, gradually people began playing guitar there in the afternoons, and one thing evolved into another until it began to be a regular nightclub. And through that, I met many musicians and uh, began doing stage clothes for them. People would come, tourists were beginning to come back into the Haight at that point. And people would come from all around the world. You know, I sold the denim jacket that I did for the denim art contest that I refer to in Levi's Denim Art Book um, to a Swiss psychologist. And people came saying they'd seen my hats in Paris and in London and in Hawaii because we made denim hats with pieces of recycled fabric from gowns and curtains and uh, crochet and lace. Anything we could find, we beaded them. We made beaded bracelets like this with Indian looms. That's now beautiful. they're just coming back. Is this one of your bracelets? No, this is one that I bought last week on 24th Street. Which reminiscent of the... Totally. This was just what we were selling, except we were selling ones that we made personally with designs from Indian rugs and Afghan rugs, tribal rugs, and uh, Art Nouveau designs. Do you think that a lot of your artwork that came from uh, vintage curtains, lace, you name it, somehow had some kind of idea behind it of we're saving our environment, you know, let's use up I what we have rather than cut what is not used yet. Let's use all the stuff not being used. Let's save our earth and our resources somehow. Well, Rebecca, it wasn't exactly that because um, it was more an act of preserving the culture in whatever pieces we were using. Preserving patterns, textures, crafts that, that were becoming hard to find. Hard to they were almost it. becoming extinct. It wasn't that they were cheaper, it was that they were rarer. Right. They were more beautiful. 
Sometimes we would go to thrift stores uh, in Salinas, go way out into the country to thrift stores, to places where veterans from the different wars had um, brought back Japanese kimonos from World War II and things like that. And we picked those things up. And it was, it was more of um, a Pres sense of preservation. Uh, preservation and beauty. And then, of course, it was the challenge to create something beautiful from it, from it exactly. and something that worked and clicked like you're making a painting. Exactly. Textile art is an art. And so you then saw this sign for rent. Was it, was it history? Did you rent the place? Did you? Yes, I rented it, it right it a, there. Did you give it a name? Uh, your... mm -hmm. I named it Vexilla, which is Latin for banners. And I've always, I've had a Latin classics background, so has my husband. And uh, places on Haight Street had outrageous names. It had a history of that, you know? And I liked the esoteric uh, reverence, but it also seemed heraldic, you know, that it was maybe a spearhead of the culture in some way. And I did end up making banners, ultimately. It developed into my primary work, which has been banner work. Did you, did you bring anything with you from... Uh, this is one of um, four banners that we were hanging from the loft at, at the United States Cafe. We used to project light shows. And we had these hanging from the loft. And I did four of these. Usually the work that I did was much larger than this. But this was actually meant to be hanging this way. And these, this set of four banners was used at one of the very early Haight Street fairs. And then I had a larger banner that was stretched across the street. And that was really exciting because the wind comes down Haight Street. Sure. And we had people at the tops of buildings risking their lives to try to get the lines across. <laughs> but, um, exactly. um, yeah. So that was, um, that was my work at, uh, the United States Cafe, which turned then into Shady Grove. And those people began producing concerts in the park. So also. We, we had an interview with Joe Buck, well, Marty Ballin's father, mm -hmm. and he talked about his times of going to Shady Grove and Marty playing there and the involvement of it. And now I'm seeing through this oral history project, we're getting to know what was there before and yes. what it was. I, I see you brought some other pieces that you made. Were these pieces made uh, for friends? These are pieces that are similar to what you sold in your shop? Uh, uh, the pieces. Any stories behind these? The, the pieces that I made, I, I made them custom for people. And I also um, just explored textures and color. And they were just the available inventory sure. at the store. Some pieces of yours were used in a, in a display from uh, a 60s exhibit or, or uh, read in your uh, credits yeah, that you had done some internship and uh, uh, with, the, with the Museum of, of Modern Art and uh, did you, that it was on your notes. The De Young Museum. The De Young Museum. Yes. Okay. I, I worked on the Rainbow Show at the De Young Museum. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah and tell we, me we basically that? used these the skills that I incorporated into decorating the clothing and, and doing the inventory. The only things we sold that we didn't make ourselves were leotards right. and tights. Right. And at that point, it was very difficult. Clothing didn't in, involve leotards unless you were a dancer. And so I had to get right. a special contract with Danskin to be able to have the leotards. And that was, that was pretty interesting because now you see stretched clothing all over all the place, over the but it wasn't around in the early 70s. Right, it was all cotton. Yeah, but through working on the Rainbow Show, uh, I worked with women from the Rhode Island School of Design and the College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland. And uh, we did everything. We made, at that point, the largest quilt in the world. Wow. And uh, all the panels, we would treat differently. We would dye them, we would stud them, we would um, fringe them, sew some of them loose, some of them very tight, and we made an enormous quilt of a um, water lily pond wow. that took up an entire room. And then we would make wow. rocks and wall hangings and 
it was two entire rooms of the Dion Museum. It took one season that those rooms were closed to the public to produce. What, what you have on right now? This is a dress that I made from a tablecloth. And okay. this is the, the kind of thing that we did. We, we found these pieces in stores that were um, considered old-fashioned. And it's, uh, you've, kept, you've kept the, the integrity of the piece because oh, that's what you can head your arm down. That's the complete circle. The other There's part the is that it's easy. <laughs> Amazing. They were angel dresses. Angel dresses. <laughs> that is a, I mean, that, I mean, I saw in many different fabrics in the 60s and the 70s, mm -hmm. the style. It's beautiful. And you still have it. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And amazing. these styles are still coming back. Oh, it's all retro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the best of the past, hopefully. Um, you have some other pieces that you made. I would love to see them. Well, this is one of our hats, which is basically denim, but sometimes only a brim would be denim. And we would use different materials. Um, now they make them in different materials, uh, solid. Um, but we were playing with color and texture. This is silkscreen. This is the name of my shop, Vexilla. I, I made this as a promotional hat. Very. It's amazing, and you still have it. It's this is amazing. an applique from an evening gown. Yeah. All um, different this textures. This is upholstery material. All different textures, yeah. embroidery, applique. This was an old princess dress. Oh, wow. <laughs> See, it's, so that's what patchwork is, is. Each piece of fabric tells a story. Right. And uh, that's what you've done there. Mm -hmm. Another version of patchwork quilt. Mm-hmm. I would love to see something else. That we can have you seen this jacket yet? No, I'd love to see it. This is a jacket from my boutique, um, military insignia, cords from stage curtains, um, the two sleeves have different cuffs. It's beautiful. Things aren't matching, but they go together. And then the and then you added a collar. The collar is a fur collar. A so it's a warm skin, jacket. And like the um, Air Force jackets used to have. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Well, you need a warm jacket on Hate Street after five. Oh, okay. it's beautiful. It still fits you. It's wonderful. Whoops. Here we go. Very beautiful. Really, really beautiful. That's a, that's a beautiful jacket. Thank you. It's a museum piece. It should be in a display case. It's Thank wonderful. You. Wonderful. Um, well, the jackets were in the museum. They were yes. in the Dion Museum. The jackets that we made for the denim art contest, me and my partner, Martha Coleman, and they went on tour across the United States. And um, those are the jackets that are in the book, Levi's Denim Art. So it's, it's um, probably not enough time to mention all the things you've made and been involved with, but um, I understand that you've been, you were also beyond the, the early 70s here and your arts and carried you in this community, worked on a lot of events in Golden Gate Park. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of the Haight-Ashbury Golden Gate Park. Um, and worked backstage, uh, whether you were making artists, articles of clothing for entertainers or whether you were designing the mm -hmm. look and putting a backdrop up. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, event. I made the, the backdrops for quite a few shows with Billy McCarthy and Unity Foundation. Um, I did the Unity Foundation banners, which would be up at every show. Often, I would work with organizations like Chet Helms and Margot St. James, um, who would, they would do repeated concerts. And so the same banners would be used in different locations and for different events. Do you remember any where the location or any of these events were or what any, what any of the bands were that played or any of... Uh, the names of the events? Uh, well, the present, Hooker's I mean, Balls. I Hooker's did balls. banners for the Hooker's Ball, starting with the second Hooker's Ball. I did the. I did actually a custom jacket for a bail bondsman for the first Hooker's Ball. And <laughs> as I was finishing it up for him to wear, I did a tuxedo jacket out of pieces of recycled denim. And as I finished the piece, he invited me to the ball. Ah. So that was my introduction to the Hooker's Ball. And I didn't have anything to wear. The ball was that night. So I used 
the cutout pieces that were left over from the jeans that I cut to make his jacket to make a very brief skirt, skirt. but it worked for a hooker's ball. Oh, exactly. <laughs> it was perfect. And that was at Longshoreman's Hall. And then the next year I did the Coyote Banner, which is a charming design done by David Wills here in the Ashbury. And he has worked with Margo for several designs, and I have uh, interpreted his designs. We've actually interviewed David. For so the Masquerade Corporation. Compliments what he said. Mm -hmm. I did the Coyote Banner. I did the Masquerade Corporation Banner for another hooker's ball. And um, I did the most ambitious of them all, the Victoria Woodhull Foundation Banner, which is based on the design of the Great Seal of the United States. And wow. that's an 11 by 11. Wow. And um, I believe that was at the Cow Palace. We had them at the San Francisco Hilton at the Cow Palace. Um, they were very large venues, and they got bigger every year until Margot finally decided to retire them. Exactly. And then the tribal stomps, Chet Helms gave uh, what was, I think, uh, dedicated to the first tribal stomp in the 60s here in the Haight-Ashbury, in the Panhandle. And he gave that at the Greek Theater in Berkeley. And I did the banners for the two sides of the Greek Theater stage, which were used again at the Monterey County Fairgrounds for the second tribal stomp. And they were borrowed by several other uh, music producers for their shows. Family Dog Productions was Chet's company, and Family Fog Productions, Doug Green's company up north, right. used them for several shows. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um... In, uh, do, you, do you now, that is 2005, and this is your home, and you live here, and you're a member of the community, mm -hmm. and a very active member, and being mm -hmm. creative, and with all the spirit that mm -hmm. the hate ever had, and through the 60s and now, um, do you still feel comfortable here? Do you feel the hate is a place um, where you can walk down the street and maybe meet a friend? Do you feel... Always. Always. As a matter of fact, I can never... I can never promise when I'll be home if I go up to Hate Street for anything. You know, I might be an hour later. Right. <laughs> I always run into people I know, and it's, it's really come around to being as beautiful as it ever was. How, how do you feel with, with your, with your uh, dreams of what you want in life and your creativity? Where do you see life going in creativity? Where, do you, where would you like to focus your future on, on the work you do? Well, I've always followed the trail of consciousness and people I feel at home with who have similar ideals and similar um, aesthetics. And everything I've done has, has been led to me by by another person. So I think it's communication. I think it's communication and appreciating everyone that you know and how briefly we may have the opportunity to know them, right. to realize what their skills are and to make everyone feel a part of it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you would like to continue that journey in your life? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I continued working with Maritime Hall, doing more concerts, um, and um, there are more coming up that um, I hope to be involved with. But what I enjoy most is seeing large numbers of people getting together, feeling really good, really happy, being with their friends and meeting new friends. Well this, it, well, this is very inspiring, and I'm hoping that when this video is shown, we will invite you back again. We can add to your life's history and your contribution to the Haight-Ashbury and beyond. Um, I'm just, I just know when this video is pulled in 50 years and some young person watches it, they might find themselves there and might be inspired by the works that you've done. I thank want to you. thank you so much for being here, and it's a pleasure, and... Uh, to document what has happened helps inspire. When one person sees one person can do it, they can try themselves. So thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank, thank you. you, Rebecca.